Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. My name is uh, Geert Jan. I'm a, I work at Oracle. Before that, I worked at Sun Microsystems. And in Oracle, I'm increasingly working in, uh, the, on the JavaScript strategy that Oracle has. And I want to talk about something that many people may not be aware of, of what I would call a second generation um, development of JavaScript frameworks and libraries. And I want to position this around a number of organizations, surprising organizations that have open source stacks and how you can use them, what the benefits are, what the advantages, um, disadvantages, etc. So in the enterprise, so I'm thinking about large organizations like, like the Oracle, the Microsoft, the banks, uh, ING, um, in logistics, in healthcare, in, in insurance, in banking, these kinds of domains, increasingly applications look like this, of course. They're, they're increasingly mobile applications. And if they're not mobile applications, then they're very, um, very uh, engaging a graph chart, um, map, gauge oriented applications on the desktop browser. And this, this is happening in the enterprise. This is all over the enterprise, of course. This isn't simply hobby projects or small projects. These are large enterprise front ends. And increasingly, we see these um, being written in JavaScript in these large organizations, where maybe five or 10 years ago, these large organizations looked very skeptically at JavaScript because JavaScript is constantly changing, which is a wonderful thing. It's constantly growing, constantly innovating. But if you're a large enterprise, that's not a very good thing because you want stability. You would rather have a boring, stable uh, ecosystem than one that is constantly changing. So this is, of course, the problem that everyone faces. You know, all these different, um, all these different libraries, all these different frameworks, you know, making the right choice. What is the right choice? Something that's the right choice today in three years or three months or two weeks could be the wrong choice. How do you, I mean, this is the key problem of this, of this ecosystem. And that's as true for large enterprises as for startups as for people working on something at home. So this is, on the one hand, you know, this thing of this is wonderful, this is innovative, I can, con I can constantly learn, which is fantastic. But for the enterprise, you know, you want stability, you want reliability, you want maintainability, you want all of these um, kind of boring abilities, but um, the, the kinds of abilities that you need for, for large, um, large systems, large enterprise systems in logistics, healthcare, banking, finance, these kinds of things. So uh, in the case of Oracle, for example, traditionally these kinds of technologies um, have been used. So ADF, Apex, and Forms, and if you're not in the Oracle ecosystem, you've never heard of these things. These are very proprietary to Oracle. And increasingly, it becomes difficult to find people with these skills. And when you go to the, to the conferences of these particular types of technology stacks, you see a high dominance of gray-haired people, which nothing wrong with gray-haired people, but it does kind of indicate that this, these are not the kinds of technology stacks where there is growth um, in. And also, when you look at, um, at the Java ecosystem in general, which is what an, an enterprise like, um, like Oracle or Microsoft or SAP or whatever would intuitively first go for because it's been around longer, because it's got these libraries, because it's got this ecosystem, because you know, this, there's this stability and there's this specification-based um, uh, approach. There are a number of technologies um, out there. But what you have seen um, in, the, in the last couple of years is really that JavaScript is being used um, in these large enterprises. And key reasons are that the browser is everywhere. You know, the, if there has been a war between platforms, the browser platform has won. I mean, the browser is on every single device. And the native language of the browser, at least right now anyway, is JavaScript. So it makes sense to ask yourself, well, maybe we should rather than using an, an abstraction such as these Oracle technologies or some Java framework, use JavaScript directly. And a number of these organizations have been um, um, experimenting with this internally over a number of years and have been, um, over the past years since then, open sourcing and putting those technology stacks out on GitHub um, to get more engagement from, um, from the developer community. So people coming out of colleges, universities know these these, these libraries, no the idioms, no JavaScript. So in the case of Oracle, for example, um, switching to a JavaScript-oriented front-end technology um, within Oracle results in its partners and customers doing the same thing, which as a consequence has that for the first time, a number of them are able to hire new young developers. 
because there is just so much work out there for developers. If you go for a, a job interview as a developer, you are in fact interviewing that organization. They are not interviewing you. You are there to see whether they have the technology stack that matches your desires. So if you go for an interview somewhere and they say to you, well, come and work for us on our proprietary technology stack, and you say to them, well, I'm going to leave in three years, what can I do with what I've learned here? And then they'll say, well, it's proprietary, you have to stay in the ecosystem, basically, in our specific ecosystem. So now, um, by means of using these open source corporate technology stacks, organizations are able to attract new developers because of it being open source and because this is this enables um, a transfer of, of, of skills from one organization to the other within that open source domain. So one can really talk about a second generation. Um, one was always talking and comparing Angular versus Backbone versus Ember versus this versus that. And maybe, especially if you're in, in the enterprise uh, ecosystem, uh, enterprise developer of some kind, you should instead be thinking about comparing these corporate solutions. And this obviously the, the large uh, software vendors. So Salesforce has its stack, Microsoft has its stack, Oracle has its stack. But did you know that there are other types of organizations that you would not expect to have these kinds of stacks? So who here has heard of Kraken? So Kraken, um, very interesting. It turns out PayPal has its own open source division, which I learned about when I was at a conference and the keynote was done by a VP from PayPal. And the keynote at this developer conference he wouldn't have been able to do if he had been talking about their proprietary stack. But because PayPal, like anyone else, is looking for new developers, they have an open source story and enabling their VP to go to developer conferences, you know, stand on the stage, sponsor the conference and say, come and work for us, we have this wonderful open source um, technology stack. So the, the process by means of which these um, technology stacks develop is always the same. So first is this internal experimentation, for example, in PayPal. Internal experimentation. Let's look at Angular, let's look at React. At some point, the organization says, enough experimentation, we need to standardize. And then an internal technology stack is developed within that organization. And at some point, someone says in that organization, well, we have something that is really coherent and usable by anybody. We want to attract more people. All the building blocks of our stack are open source anyway. Why don't we put it on GitHub? And then put it on GitHub. Um, so, so this is one example, Kraken. So here you have, so if you're using these building blocks already, Kraken is a great way to, um, a, a great solution to use to combine them. So they use React, they use Node, all the um, usual suspects. Um, if you look also, so not just at, um, at um, at PayPal, but here's some other examples. So it turns out Walmart. Did you know Walmart is an IT organization? Now, of course Walmart is an IT organization. Every organization, every company nowadays is an IT organization. So Walmart has, um, uh, has an, an open API. It has uh, uh, an open source story. Did you know the Financial Times is on GitHub? Same story. They have a technology stack they developed inside their organization. Another example is Uber. Uber is on GitHub. Their internal technology stack consisting of various open source components and libraries is published on GitHub. So it makes sense to take a look at these different, um, these different solutions. There are two warning signs, however. The first is a large enterprise putting something on GitHub could be a large enterprise saying, we don't care about this technology stack. Could be. So be very careful whether this means this is the end of our interest in it. We are giving it away. Or does it mean we want to get the community involved with our direction? That's, that's the first question to be really careful about. So there was a, a bank a number of years ago that went to a lot of conferences and talked about their technology stack, and the VP was on stage, and so on. And if you go to their GitHub repo now, you'll see. It's very, the nice thing with GitHub is you can see the, the, the amount of development going on. There's, there's nothing hidden. So you can see in that case, well, they've done nothing in the last five years. So then you wonder, okay, should we use this? The second question to ask is, is the business I'm doing comparable to the business that is done by the vendor putting out this technology stack onto GitHub? So if your business is not very similar to the Financial Times, or if your business is not very similar to Walmart, maybe you should ask yourself, well, does this really fit my requirements? So if you're in the 
obviously, if you're in the software business, creating software products, creating um, web apps of whatever kind, then it makes sense to say, well, our business is maybe we are a partner of Microsoft, we are a partner of Salesforce, we are a partner of this particular uh, vendor. Let's see how they do things, and let's see if they have an open source solution that we can um, leverage. So that's, that's basically a, the, the kind of direction that, is, that has clearly been, um, been going on over the last couple of years. Uh, in each of these cases, what these technology stacks need to respond to are a number of enterprise requirements. So the question is never, in these cases, what is the latest, coolest library? Never. The question is always, what is the stablest library? What is the stablest library out there? Because, I mean, all these different frameworks and libraries are morally similar. I mean, if you know React, you can learn Angular. If you, if you know Knockout, you can learn Vue. These are, these are all variations and dialects of each other. The first question is always, is it stable? Is it stable? Has it been around for a while? Um, is there documentation? Is there a community around it? Um, can I find things on Stack Overflow? Is it stable? Will it still be there in a number of years' time? That's, a, that's an important question in the enterprise. It's not what is cool, what is new. Um, does it have built-in solutions for doing responsive design? I mean, are there templates to set things up? Are there ways to scaffold things? Are there solutions around accessibility and around internationalization? So these are, I mean, there are specifications around, around this that large enterprises need to comply with. So if they choose a technology stack, it needs to have some solutions around this. Are there data visualization capabilities? Do I need to go and look for graphs and charts somewhere? Or can I simply use them out of the box from this particular stack? Um, are, there, are there solutions around security? The biggest question that an enterprise has. So how are security issues handled? Um, can I tweak? Can I, can I optimize performance? Another big question you have in the enterprise. Um, what are the standards it conforms to? Um, are there ways to empower more business users? So is it just a code-oriented solution? And also um, documentation and support. Not obvious at all, right, in the JavaScript ecosystem. Now, you, there's a cool new library out there, and you start using it, and you do Hello World, and it's fantastic, and then the very next step, there's a problem. And then you write to the random person in the basement who created this wonderful library, and they say, yeah, thanks, but I'm working on something different now. So this is not a, 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 this is not a, 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 a nice thing for, for enterprise developers. You want something stable and reliable and, and consistent and so on. So in the case of Oracle, as, as one example of this particular um, 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 thought pattern, um, we ended up choosing jQuery, very boring. We ended up choosing Knockout, not the latest thing. Um, Cordova for, for packaging everything together. Require.js for modularity. What is nice about Require.js and about Knockout is that they are very specifically and narrowly focused on one particular thing. So this is another thing that um, is worth thinking about. Are you choosing a framework that locks you in, especially a vendor-driven framework, or are you choosing a, a modular, loosely structured, flexible architecture? Because things are changing all the time. So if you have this very strongly vendor-focused framework, <laughs> Will you be able to keep up with all the changes? Are you able to experiment? Are you able to throw in new libraries and adapt and, and, and adapt to change? So in the case of the approach taken at Oracle is, let's just choose a few libraries out there, combine them together, make it flexible, make it extensible. So if you know require, um, you know, you just, there's a require configuration file. You just add new libraries into that configuration file and, and you're done. So really, if you know require, if you know knockout, if you know jQuery, you know everything that, 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 that you need to know in order to be able to use Oracle's enterprise technology stack out of the box. Then recently added was Webpack and, uh, and TypeScript. So TypeScript-based development is also possible. So in the case of how Oracle looks at things in this uh, JavaScript space, it's purely a front-end solution. So back-end is completely open, no connection to any particular DB or whatever. Um, you would have REST endpoints, you would have web sockets, and Oracle's technology stack, which is called JET, it stands for JavaScript Extension Toolkit, is based on top of that, that back end of REST endpoints and web sockets, and it's just a, a model view view model of knockout, uh, jQuery, require, uh, routing built in for bookmarks, so require for modularity, and built in support for, for web components. So to show you what this looks like, on the command line in a folder and I say OJET, so there's a, there's a small command line tool that you can install via NPM. 
create a, an app of some kind. And there are different templates for scaffolding. And then you kick off the process. So this is a, this, this is a little command line tool that you um, can install via NPM. It's all free, and it just sets up the, the application for you. It takes about two minutes to download the library, so it actually downloads jQuery. Beneath this are things like Bower and, and Grunt. Don't need to learn Bower and Grunt. Uh, it all hides it within that particular tool. And it very quickly generates the application. And here we are. And then we go into that um, application, and we say OJET serve. And it serves up the application into the browser, and you have a pure front end. And you can then connect to any back end or whatever you need. So within about two minutes of starting this application, we should have it served up and shown in the browser. And then this is exactly what people all over Oracle are doing. So all of Oracle's newest front ends are created in this way. So here we have a starting point. If we change the resolution, you can see it's responsive. So we get the hamburger icon um, shown with the typical um, menu structure for mobile. So out of the box, responsive design, single page application architecture. Because all over Oracle, there are developers switching from Java front ends and all kinds of other front ends to JavaScript. And they're doing it in this way. They don't need to think about responsive design in, in their initial setup. They don't need to think about the project structure. They don't need to think about single page application architecture. It's all simply built into the template that sets us up. So now the next step is we want to have some content. So open any editor you like. And so I work a lot on NetBeans, which is in Apache. And here is the source structure. So um, view models and views. So here are the HTML templates. And here are the JavaScript files. And there's a one-to-one -one match with the tabs you see in the browser, dashboard, incidents, customers, about. So the dashboard tab consists of a define block in a file called dashboard.js and an HTML file in dashboard HTML. So here we have the, the two files together that create a module. This is simply a require.js module that is loaded into the application um, by means of the single page application architecture so as a fragment into the index file. So now we need to have some content. So there's a cookbook. So all over Oracle, people are switching to JavaScript. And if you're a JavaScript developer, you like nothing more than if you need a daytime picker, you go to google.com, look for JavaScript daytime picker, find some random snippet, copy and paste it into your application. Right. So that's very dangerous in the enterprise, of course. You want to control where everything comes from. So this, this is a controlled environment. This is an open, uh, open page um, online you can go to where all the components are found. So here's one of them. So here is a bar chart. And there's, there's many different kinds of charts, all enterprise oriented. And you can see here that there's HTML and there's, and there's JavaScript. And I can tweak these, this graph live. So this is actually running live in the browser. You can see there's a toolbar along the bottom here. And I'm now going to just remove those tags from the HTML, and I say apply. So I'm updating the browser live, so I can tweak all the components live until I'm happy with them. And then I copy the chart, copy from here, and paste that into my HTML file. So here is, here is the chart, so you can see there is a, a custom element, and you can see a key value, key value. And these values are JavaScript properties, so here is the JavaScript. So we simply copy and paste. And the final step is we need to um, add to the define block a reference to the chart. So this is simply using require. So here we have a reference to a J chart. And we paste it. So now I've copied from the cookbook. And I look at the application in the browser. Here's the chart. All over Oracle, people are setting up their applications like this then copying and pasting, as JavaScript developers love doing, but directly from a controlled space, so that the daytime picker that one person copies is the same daytime picker as somebody else copies. Um, and this is how we are uh, moving ahead um, in the JavaScript front-end ecosystem. Now, of course, there's also support for um, web components. So this is increasingly important. I'm going to stop this process and um, open a new little window here. And go back into that uh, folder, uh, desktop, and into an app. So here's my app structure. And I'm going to say OJET create a component FOSDEM chart. 
But very quickly, what is generated is the starting point of a component that meets the web component specification requirements. So this we can zip up and share. So there is already internally within Oracle a, an exchange full of components like this. So inside of one of these folders is found, uh, most importantly, the definition of a new custom element. So here a custom element called FOSDM chart is created. And here's the HTML file, the JavaScript file, the CSS file. So this enables us to create web components and potentially for, for the ecosystem around Oracle to base its business around creating generic components for Google Mac integration or whatever integration they would like. So what I've talked about is basically that there's a second um, generation of, um, of frameworks and libraries that are on GitHub. Um, take a look at them, compare them, um, consider which of the vendors doing this open source work are in your domain area. Um, what your organization is partner of, see what they're doing, and leverage off them. There's no need to recreate the wheel anymore. You can lift along with the developments of these large vendors, because once they have gone in a particular direction, it will take a long time before they change to something different. So these are all stable solutions that you should consider making use of, especially because they are free and open source. Thank you. So uh, we have time for questions. Who has the first question? If you, if you do have to go away, then please don't make noise and be nice. Thank you very much. Um, question, you asked, uh, you talked about uh, things being open source, uh, but there's also the evil twin. Uh, because I would be extra worried with big organizations about patent claims coming back later to haunt me. Uh, so do you have any ideas on how to, to combat that fear or, or take it away or, to some degree? Well, read, the, read the, the, um, the FAQ of that particular project very carefully and make sure that the licensing is okay. So in the case of the Oracle Jet solution, it's, it's MIT license, which is about as liberal as you can go. But you need to just make sure that, that the licensing is really appropriate to your, to your needs. And in the, in the case of an organization like Oracle, Oracle really wants people to use this. So you, you, there's no way that afterwards anyone's going to say, hey, why are you using this? So you need to really look at why is a particular technology stack out on GitHub? Is it because it's being dumped by an organization? And if you start using it, you know, be, be concerned? Or is it because they want to attract more developers in their ecosystem? In which case, more than likely, no one is going to come after you because they want you to use it. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, 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 oh somebody, question right here. Quick, 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 microphone coming behind you. Behind you. Forward. Yeah, we like a team as well. Hey, so uh, an open source pro like my experience with open source projects is uh, you get a bug fix, like someone is using it. Uh, they see that something's wrong with it. They make a bug fix, and even if it's not perfect, <laughs> An open source project with not many um, like full-time people on it will accept that bug fix and it will be good enough and stuff like that. But with a bigger organization, it's sometimes harder to get stuff in upstream and then you have to uh, basically patch them and s do crazy st yeah. stuff ar around that. So how uh, open is Oracle, I mean, and other big yeah. companies well, and, for and this? I think what you will see in all these organizations, and Oracle is the same, like in the first... Um, open source release, it was only, it was only available for um, the partners of Oracle. Like it, it, was for, it was available for everybody, but only partners could use it in production. That was the first phase. The next phase, which is right now, is everything is on GitHub. Um, you, um, you, can, you can use it, whatever, but you can't, you can't do pull requests on it yet. And then, so it's, it's always going to be in stages. And the next stage, once it's all stabilized, and, and, and you know, the next stage would be, hey, let's accept pull requests. But you should, you should really ask these questions when you're looking at these kinds of different offerings um, because exactly this. Um, and and, and it, it's also, I think, a question of, in the case of Oracle, I, I think 
um, the community around it is growing because all of Oracle's partners and customers have wanted to use JavaScript for years. But there's never been an official way for Oracle partners and customers to do that. So some did Angular, some did React, some did this, some did that. So now Oracle is standardized. So now all Oracle's downstream partners and customers, if they do JavaScript, they will do it like this. So this will create a community. So right now one of the, uh, one of the employees of one of the partners is, is writing a book on Oracle Jet in anticipation of this becoming more and more popular. So then you build up a community. So then you could uh, envision um, the community being involved in reviewing the bugs, for example. So it, it, it's always going to be some, some kind of uh, uh, conflict, in a way, between the, the commercial interests of the enterprise and its open source vision. But it, you have to just see what, what's going on per project. Thank you very much. Thank you.